Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. One thing before we start the show. I want to let you know about a special interview you'll hear at the end of this episode. It's with the host of a brand new podcast called Art Architects, the architects of art. The cool thing is this show is hosted by Director X and Taj Critchlow, two of the biggest music video directors on the planet. These guys are responsible for game-changing videos from artists like Drake and Coldplay and Kendrick Lamar and so many more. Hope you enjoyed the discussion. I sure did. That's coming up at the end of this episode. All right, let's get on with things. If you have been around long enough, you may remember those special times when you know, I mean, you just know that you're in the middle of music history being made. You might be old enough to remember the early 90s. So much new and cool music came out. It's led by grunge, but supported by all manner of alternative music. The stuff that came out in 91, 92, 93, 94, 95 was, was so incredible that you knew you were in the midst of a very special time. It felt like not a day went by without there being a new song, a new artist, a new sound, a new scene worth checking out. It was the alternative revolution. And it was awesome. And so much of it seemed to be directed at and just perfect for you. Just for you. But that was hardly the first time something like this happened. Those who were teenagers in the middle 50s also knew that they were part of something special during the birth of rock and roll. The history of the 1960s was largely written in the music of that decade. Starting with the Beatles in 1964, every day seemed to bring something new, something exciting, and something groundbreaking. If you were tied in with punk in the 1970s, there was a sense among you and your friends that this was a really special time for music and a good time to be alive. But what I want to talk about is the era that came immediately after punk. Punk changed the way people looked at music, breaking down artistic, social, and demographic barriers. Basically, what I'm saying is that a new generation of musicians ripped it all up and started rock and roll all over again. That's basically punk in a nutshell. But that attitude didn't end with the original punk rock explosion. Instead, we saw an unstoppable chain reaction that resulted in sounds and styles and scenes that could not have been possible had punk not got there first. These sounds weren't punk, but you could tell by listening that something like punk had to have happened for this music to exist. We now call this the post-punk era, and this period of time, roughly from 1978 through to the middle 80s, created the foundations for the alternative revolution in the 90s and beyond. Let's look at this. It's the post-punk explosion part one, and we begin with this thing called New Wave. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Welcome again. A little Elvis Costello from 1977 to start things. I'm Alan Cross, and this is the first part of a series of shows that examine the kinds of music that resulted from the original punk era. Again, none of this stuff is punk, but it's music that could have not happened without punk getting there first. And we are going to dive deep into the era of post-punk, late 70s through to the middle 80s. Punk rebooted rock. It was stripped back to the bone and built up into something new, some new sounds. And the first of these new sounds was called New Wave which began to appear in 1978. Punk was peaking, but it was also on its way to burning out. And this requires some unpacking. 1978 was a very, very important year because that's when popular music began to segment into a hundred different distinct streams. Substreams, actually. Before 1978, things were fairly simple. And I know I'm generalizing here, but follow me on this. We had rock, we had pop, we had country, we had R&B. Each had their own flavors, but almost everything could be easily sorted into those four buckets. Post-78, though, things got a lot more complicated. Country began its bifurcation, classic styles and modern country. R&B's main sounds, which included funk and soul, began mutating even faster, expanding to include disco and, within a year, hip-hop. Same thing with mainstream rock. People were now talking about metal and prog and folk rock and soft rock and country rock and blues rock, and, of course, punk. 
As cool as punk was, it did have its limitations. I mean, how long could you go on being so angry, thrashing over two or three chords? It seemed so 1976, if you know what I mean. The result was some interesting cross-pollination. Even though punk partly grew out of a reaction to the insipid pop heard on AM radio in the 1970s, there was a certain reconciliation with this. Pop and punk had a baby, and they called it New Wave. The result was the whole New Wave thing, but the sound and attitude came before the name. Now, i got to explain this. The groups making this new music weren't exactly punk, but when you listen to their music, you can tell it had punk DNA. For example, the Sex Pistols and The Clash and The Ramones were definitely punk. So were all the other bands that thrashed about angrily on their guitars. But where did something like this fit? Listening to that song from Blondie, who were, of course, a major part of Ground Zero of New York punk at CBGB, you you would never mistake that for pure punk rock, right? It had the right attitude. It had the same do-it-yourself philosophies. It was anti-corporate and everything about it. But there was both something more going on and something less. The more involved things like melody and tried-and-true pop songwriting sensibilities. It was also more fun, often veering into quirkiness and nerdiness. Meanwhile, there were less politics, less class struggle, less anger. Compared to mainstream rock, it relied far less on the blues for its structure and sound. It was twitchy, spiky, choppy, and sometimes nervous, agitated, and paranoid. Lots of songs had stop, start, and other experimental structures and approaches. The vocals were delivered differently. They were geeky, yelpy, jittery, uptight, and often higher in pitch, and sometimes marbled with all kinds of insecurity. Lyrics tended to be artsy, intellectual, and all for clever, sometimes for the sake of being clever. The performers were mostly white. In fact, there was often a suburban sort of vibe around everything. When they danced, the moves were often pretty robotic, jerky, like the music. And there wasn't a lot of sexual bravado, but there was a lot of sexual fluidity. And when it came to fashion, New Wave had a look all its own. You're probably already thinking about skinny ties and big glasses. Okay, so what about the term New Wave? This was originally applied to a new generation of French filmmakers in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Then, some critics started using it in the very early 70s to describe artsy, non-mainstream bands like the New York Dolls and the Velvet Underground. In England, punk and new wave were almost interchangeable in some circles. But there were new bands in the punk world who wanted to distance themselves from the more intense punk groups, more traditional punk groups. So they started using the term new wave to describe what they did. Another term was new music, with music spelled M-U-S-I-C-K. The earliest references we can find to the term new wave are in a British fanzine called Sniff and Glue in 1976. The writers were trying to make a connection between the lofty, artsy ambitions of some British punks and those renegade French filmmakers of the 1950s and 60s. Later that year, a story in Melody Maker magazine quoted Sex Pistols manager Malcolm McLaren, very artsy guy, using the term New Wave and applying it to bands that were related to punk, part of the same scene as punk, but not necessarily sounding that punk at all. And within a year, it seems to have caught on as a term describing the underground music that was coming up behind punk. Then, across the Atlantic in New York, a record label called Sire was having a marketing crisis. The head of the company, a guy named Seymour Stein, was a fan of what was happening at CBGB and had signed a bunch of these new bands, including the Ramones. The problem was that Sire could not get any of their acts on the radio. Mainstream radio stations of the day would not touch anything tainted as punk rock. They hated anything associated with that word. It evoked music that was too dangerous, too weird, too violent, too polarizing, too class conscious, and too political. And I swear this is true. Back then, rock radio stations would not play a Ramones record any more than they would play a Bee Gees record. That's how the American industry felt about punk rock. It was a fad that needed to be ignored, so it would just go away. 
And so it came to pass that at a marketing meeting at Sire Records, somebody suggested that they use the term new wave to describe their new signings. It's possible that someone at the meeting had noted that a magazine called The New York Rocker had been using the term starting around Christmas 1976. So Sire launched an ad campaign called Don't Call It Punk, urging people to call this new music New Wave. And it worked. Just like that, the stigma of punk and the suspicions attached to that scene were wiped away. So, New Wave it was then. Talking Heads, one of the first bands branded by Sire Records as New Wave. And by the end of 1977, the phrase had caught on in North America. Time and Newsweek, which is about as mainstream as you can get, both wrote stories on the punk-slash-New Wave movement. But there was still a lot of confusion about what exactly everybody was talking about. At first, it applied to the new underground groups from the UK, at least by those on this side of the Atlantic. But in the UK, other terms evolved. Remember that they got to new wave first, so they were moving on. There was new pop as a term, postmodern was another, and like I mentioned earlier, new music. In America, new wave was the way forward, but it became really, really broad. For example, when Tom Petty first appeared with his short, sharp songs and anti-corporate stance, some people in the industry categorized him as a new wave artist. But As the months went by, New Wave became the thing, especially after some of these acts began to crack the charts and end up on television. The descriptor became like punk, but intelligent. That's a quote, like punk, but intelligent. But like punk, except weirder, might have been better. I remember buying the seven-inch single for this song. I'd never heard of this band before, but they were always showing up in magazines that covered this new music. And I had read that they were weird and different, which made them a bit scary. I expected them to sound like the Sex Pistols or like the Clash. Angry, fast, intense. What could they do to a classic like Satisfaction by the Stones? This was not what I expected. That's Devo from their 1978 debut album, Are We Not Men, We Are Devo. When the teenage me put that on the turntable for the first time, I was very confused. It was my first real introduction to this thing called New Wave. In a moment, we'll look at how New Wave continued to expand in terms of reach and sound. This is part one of a series of shows on all the alt-rock music that was spawned by the original punk rock era of the 1970s. And we're talking about the entire New Wave scene right now a period that extended roughly from 1978 through to, uh, we're going to say 1984. And we can divide that time into two periods. The first featured hundreds, if not thousands, of guitar-driven alternative pop bands who had been freed by punk to experiment. And as these new groups started to come to our attention, many of them came from cities other than New York and London, the two main centers of punk. This not only included Toronto, Chicago, and Los Angeles, but places like Akron, Ohio, and this leads us to the Pretenders. The Pretenders were a crucial bridge between old school punk and the era of new wave. Singer Chrissy Hynan was originally from the tire producing town of Akron, Ohio. In fact, she went to Firestone High School. But She couldn't see Akron in her future, so she followed her musical dreams to the UK, where she became deeply involved in the earliest days of the punk scene. She worked at Sex, Malcolm McLaren's clothing shop on King's Road, where the Sex Pistols came together. She got a job writing about this new music at one of Britain's music magazines. She played guitar in some early, early punk bands, including one that eventually morphed into The Clash, and another that became The Damned. And she almost entered into a marriage of convenience with Sid Vicious of the Sex Pistols just so she could stay in the UK and work. So, yeah, a lot of bona fide punk credentials. But Chrissy also understood the power of melody. In 1978, she formed The Pretenders with three Englishmen and began recording. One of their earliest songs was the one we just heard, a cover of the Kinks' Stop Your Sobbing. <laughs> 
Seymour Stein, remember him over at Zaire Records, liked what he heard. An edgy, punky band with a gift for songwriting. And he liked what he saw. A strong American woman fronting a band that was 75% English. To him, it didn't get any more new wave than that. Another important group was The Police. Two Englishmen and an American who played short, tight pop songs with a bit of reggae and ska flair. Definitely wasn't punk, but it was edgy, it was different. They were another perfect new wave package. And it also helped that they had a good look, especially after everyone in the band bleached their hair blonde so they could appear in a TV commercial for Wrigley's Gum. Roxanne from The Police, a new wave classic from 1978. Songs like that from The Police, along with The Pretenders and Blondie and others, was not only fun and different, but it was also perceived as being more authentic than what was populating the mainstream at the time. The rock scene featured a lot of mostly arena rock bands that some felt were too corporate. The pop scene was as lightweight as ever, and there was disco, which no cool person ever admitted to liking. It was just vacuous and empty. If you wanted to dance, well, you know what? New Wave was great for that, too. New Wave also didn't take itself too seriously. You could be goofy and fun, but in an artsy, fashionable, and semi-intellectual way. Which brings us to the B-52s. They were formed over too many cocktails in a Chinese restaurant in the unassuming college town of Athens, Georgia. Why did rock have to be so serious? So they created a sense of silliness. 50s clothing that looked like it came from a thrift shop. A bouffant hairdo from the same era that gave the band their name. A bass player? Forget that. We'll just get the guitarist to replace his lower two strings with strings from a bass. And just for fun, we'll rehearse in the bloodletting room of an abandoned mortuary. They were so goofy that some wrote them off as a novelty band. At least at first. The truth is that this mixed gender and multisexual band became an inspiration for a new generation of musicians. Kurt Cobain saw them on Saturday Night Live in 1980. He was absolutely transfixed by them. I want to play you Planet Claire from their 1979 debut album. This was Side One, Track One, and it features some mysterious Morse code, and I can decode it for you. It's what's known as a call tape or a ZKR tape. It's a recording of a message sent out by the Canadian Forces Base Mill Cove in Hubbards, Nova Scotia. It was meant to inform ships at sea about which frequencies were best for ship-to-shore communications. What we hear is N-A-W-S-D-E-C-F-H-Z-K-R-F-1-3-3-9-4, followed by more numbers. Those last four numbers are the available radio frequencies in kilohertz. Okay, that's that's really obscure, but it's cool, right? She came from planet planet. The goofy stuff from the B-52s and the power pop of the pretenders and the genre bending of the police were just what a lot of people were looking for at the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s. Never estimate the appetite for change at the start of a new decade. A new generation of musicians were freed from the rigid dogma of punk and an escape from disco, which was driving so much of the music culture at the time. Artsiness was encouraged. And because there were so few rules, fewer than even during the original punk era, the experimentation with new sounds, new looks, and new attitudes continued. But there was also an economic factor at play. As the 70s turned into 80s, the disco bubble burst, sending the recorded music industry into its worst downturn since the 1930s. This was a condition exacerbated by a worldwide recession that saw interest rates skyrocket. It was a terrible time economically. Record labels found that it was cheaper to produce and release records by this new generation of new wave bands than it was to do the same with bigger mainstream acts. That economic reality led to more labels signing more new wave groups. And they weren't wrong. The investments on return could be phenomenal. And here's the best example. In 1979, Capitol Records sent a new L.A. band called The Knack into the studio to record a debut album. Two weeks later, it was done. Total budget, $18,000. 
Get the Knack was released on June 11th, 1979. By June 24th, just 13 days later, the album had sold 1 million copies, and it was Capitol's fastest-selling debut record since Meet the Beatles in 1964. The first single was also the fastest-selling single for Capitol since the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand, and it stayed at number one on the singles charts for six weeks. The profit realized by Capital on The Knack was astounding. And even though The Knack experienced some severe backlash because they became so successful so fast, other record labels realized that their way out of the economic doldrums might just be to sign more new wave bands. But radio, especially American FM rock radio, still wasn't convinced. Some stations even banned the DJs from using the term new wave on the air because it was too much of a fad. It's not going to last. And this attitude tanked the career of a lot of new wave bands. Groups that had a successful debut album saw their second album fail to gain any substantial traction. Besides, the programmer said, this stuff is just too weird. Nobody cares. This is from the same people who had no trouble playing tons of David Bowie, a guy who was new wave before there was such a thing. Thanks to the reluctance of American radio to play new wave music, the whole thing seemed to be on its way out. And it was, apparently, this short-lived fad. But then something happened that broke things wide open. That part of the story is next. We're tracing the growth of the different styles of underground rock music that followed in the wake of punk. While some new wave bands thrived on pop and rock radio, the Pretenders, Blondie, the Cars, the Police among them, others struggled to find attention outside of their original circle of fans. That all began to change on August 1st, 1981, when a new cable network called MTV signed on. We've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. Ladies and gentlemen, rock and roll. Few people believe that a channel devoted to playing something called a music video 24 hours a day, would be successful, so many cable companies refused to carry it. For example, even though MTV originated in New York City, no Manhattan cable company would carry it. And they kind of had a point. I mean, who was going to spend money making these video things? Here is a fact. When MTV signed on in the summer of 1981, their entire music library consisted of 250 videos, 30 of which were by Rod Stewart. His She Won't Dance With Me was the third video ever shown. An hour later, Sailing was the 15th video. Stewart videos were also the 37th, 51st, 77th, 97th, and 110th shown. His stuff was seen 17 times on just MTV's first broadcast day. Now, obviously, that library had to grow if MTV was going to survive. And for that, what they did was turn to the UK. The British had a long history of creating short films of artists performing songs that could be sent to TV networks in lieu of them actually performing live on the various music shows, not only in the UK, but also across the continent. This was pioneered by the Beatles as far back as the middle 1960s. Because the UK was such a great source of these films, MTV started mining them. This was also perfect for another reason. Because these video clips were made for television, Everyone who appeared in one of these things had to have a look, a fashion sense. You absolutely had to look good on television. And this led to the creation and adoption of some pretty eye-catching stuff. The result was what could be called a second British invasion. MTV's schedule began to be dominated by groups like ABC in their sharp tuxedos, Culture Club with Boy George's unique look, and the TV perfect Duran Duran. Duran Duran, one of the most successful of all the British bands branded as New Wave in North America. MTV fueled the growth and popularity of New Wave through most of the 1960s. They played all the groups that we've talked about and many more. Eurythmics, XTC, Soft Cell, Adamant, Human League, Bow Wow Wow, 
and the Go-Go's, originally a punky band, morphed into a radio-friendly new wave pop group. This music was also cheap to license for movie soundtracks, something that director John Hughes used to his full advantage for films like Sixteen Candles and Pretty in Pink and The Breakfast Club. Those soundtrack albums were filled with what were at the time edgy new bands, edgy new wave bands, many of which were from the UK, like these guys. Before we wrap up, part one of our look at the genres of the post-punk era of the late 1970s and early 80s, we need to consider something else. Remember how I said that New Wave can be divided into two distinct periods? There was something other than MTV that caused the genre to explode. That was a new type of technology that resulted in entirely new ways of composing, performing, and recording music. This contributed to the further growth and fragmentation of post-punk music. We can call it New Wave Part 2, except that there was more to it than that. We'll talk about it next time. Podcasts for this program can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else that offers on-demand audio. Please rate and recommend if you get a chance. My website is a journal of musicalthings.com. It's updated every day with all matter of music news and information. Get the newsletter too. It's free, so, you know, why not? We can also meet up on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and all email can go to alan at alancross.ca. Part two of our look at the immediate post-punk era next time. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. Before we leave today's Ongoing History of New Music podcast, uh, I want you to know that we're part of a network called Curious Cast. And Curious Cast has a lot of podcasts available on its network. And one of the new ones is called Art Cotex. And I have two of the hosts of Art Cotex with me here. Uh, we have Taj Krishlow and Director X. And we want to give you a bit of a, an introduction to what this new podcast is all about. So who wants to go first and explain exactly what you guys will be doing? And obviously, here's a hint. If you're at the end of this podcast, my podcast, Chance Start has something to do with music. So our show is pretty much about... It's in the world of music. It's pretty much us sitting down with uh, storytellers that come from music videos. Uh, I feel like we live in a world where we don't give these these amazing creative uh, artists uh, the flowers they deserve. They create some of the most uh, impactful uh, content on the planet that gets a lot of eyeballs on it. And coming from the world of music video, being in the business for over 20 years, we felt it was necessary to create a show like Architects, to sit down and hear their stories, their come ups, their journey, their process of creating some of the most iconic music videos, films, and content on the planet. Now, you guys have been deeply involved in this world for, like you say, a long time. Who have you worked with? I've directed videos for Alicia Keys, Puff Daddy, Cisco, uh, uh, Destiny's Child, Drake, Justin Bieber, Two Chains. Rosalia, Iggy Azalea, Sean Paul, Beanie Man, um, Ariana Grande. Uh, well, you know. Okay, uh, now, now now you're just bragging. Corn, <laughs> <laughs> John Mayer, the list goes on. Like we, this has literally been um, a crazy journey, and and I would say X is the goat because as long as he's been doing it, like like late '90s to now. It's still relevant. You know, like we broke our, our production company fella with uh, this music video for uh, for DJ Khaled, Drake and Bieber called Pop Star. So it's 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 been a crazy journey. And um, there were two kids from Brampton, Ontario that uh, went out to, you know, make art that broke out to the world. And now we're using our podcast as another form of storytelling, but through an audio uh, medium. OK, how are you going to make that transition? You've been telling stories through video. Now it's going to be only audio. So uh, you're going to have to change your style a little bit, I guess. I mean, we're talking to the creator, so it's a different kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, the, the story is the story of the maker. So 
It's not conceptualizing music and visuals to it. It's talking about like the last, the first podcast, the debut of our, of the show was with Dave Myers. Um, another guy that's been in the game for a long, long time. And just talking about that, the philosophy behind his approach to art, the work he's done. And, you know, as well, digging into some of the larger world issues out there. Like we have a whole talk about black lives matter, uh, on that podcast and being a white director and his perspective coming up in a black music, uh, world. So it's just a, it's a little different than what we're used to doing. Without any spoilers, give me the kind of stories that you'll be telling. Give me an example of a story. I guess the examples is pretty much their come up. Um, what they, what gravity, what, what drew them in to get into this world of uh, filmmaking, um, their influences, um, their highs, their lows, and pretty much their breakthrough moment. And, and a lot of times, to your point, um, Alan, like, when you watch a music video, you're just seeing the end result, but you don't see what, what went into to make that product and, and that, that piece of art as far as the storyboards and the, the art direction and sitting down with your head department and the collaboration. So it's pretty much we're, we're, we're giving them that kind of, you know, close set behind experience where you get to see the process of how uh, we get to the finish line. Right. Because I've, I've always, I've often watched music videos and wondered where the hell did this come from? What kind of <laughs> headspace do you have to be in to come up with these images, these storylines, these, you know, things. Uh, and, and I have no idea. Yeah. It's, it's, and that's the point of the show. Like, look, we're probably like around the same age. Like I came up, I came up in the eighties era where that's what made me fall in love with music videos, right? The MTV much music era watching videos by like, Madonna and Peter Gabriel and like Phil Collins and, and Michael Jackson and, uh, uh, and Aerosmith. And I was always fascinated by music videos and the storytelling and the dancing and the style and all that stuff. And that's what got, that's what made us fall in love with the art. So imagine if you could go back in the days and sit down with Duran Duran and talk about the hungry, like a wolf video, like what the hell compelled you guys to be in this jungle and, and, and just going through this crazy, crazy story and sitting down with like the best of the best and hearing their, the stories of the directors working with Madonna and working with the stones. And that's the beauty about the show. It's like, we get that access to these filmmakers, to these artists. I've worked with the biggest and brightest artists in the entertainment business, but learn about that journey, that creative journey, that collaboration to make the work that we see that's now on television or on YouTube. And, and before we jump, I just want to say, please follow us at Architects Pods. Uh, I can't wait for this. Sounds like a great series. Looking forward to it. It's called Art Architects with Karina Evans, Taj Critchlow, and Director X. And uh, I can't wait to hear some of these stories. Thank you so much, you guys. All right.